Welcome everyone to the uh, University of Arizona Museum of Arts uh, at the Table Speaker Series. My name is Chelsea Farrar and I am the Curator of Community Engagement for the UA Museum of Art. And thanks everyone for being here. Before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. At the institutional level, we must be proactive in broadening awareness throughout campus and beyond to ensure our students and community members feel represented and valued. Um, and this virtual format, I know that many of our guests, um, our, our attendees here today are joining us from across the United States, across Arizona for sure, and maybe even outside of the United States. And um, I encourage you all to learn what indigenous uh, native lands you inhabit. And in fact, um, if you all want to um, add to the chat where you're joining us from, and if you know the indigenous lands that you inhabit, please um, add those there too. It would be great for us all to um, see and learn where everyone's joining us from. Uh, so again, my name is Chelsea Farrar, and I am so happy to welcome you all, have you all join us here today. Um, a big thank you to our museum members who make events such as this possible. If you are not yet a member, it's a great way to support the arts in our community. It gives you access to special events, tours, talks that are not available to the public. For example, we have two incredible uh, local farm tours coming up on November 3rd, where members will have a chance to get an intimate view of two wonderful local organizations that are dedicated to nourishing and sustaining our Tucson community. And you definitely don't want to miss that. Uh, you can find more information um, about joining on our website. Um, or you can reach out to Natasha Allen, who is our museum membership coordinator. And I'll add some links here um, in a minute um, to the chat that will give you some information about um, membership, as well as some links to our website where you can find more information. Um, so our talk tonight, um, as well as all of our talks um, this season, are in conjunction with our current exhibition, Now on View, The Art of Food. Um, some of our talks coming up um, very recently um, will be um, on November 9th. We'll welcome in person the Oregon-based artist Malia Jensen, uh, whose work is uh, in the exhibition, The Art of Food, from the collections of Jordan D. Snitcher and his family foundation. Um, and she will speak about her current projects called uh, Worth Your Salt. And on December 1st, joining us for a virtual talk, Dr. Hope Jensen um, Xiao and Matthew Mars will speak about uh, local, the local food movement and the issues that impact it. And there's registration information for all of those upcoming events um, found on our website, as well as some information about the exhibition Art of Food that is now on view that just opened to the public on Sunday. Um, we're so excited to actually have this exhibition um, here and to be reopened to the public. Um, this is, in fact, our largest exhibition in a decade here at the UA Museum. It includes over 100 works of art featuring major artists from the 20th and 21st century. Uh, and it's just really excited to have um, to have our doors open and see people back in the galleries um, and to be able to host talks, incredible talks such as this that um, are connecting to um, you know, local research um, and connects to this exhibition. It's really exciting. Um, and so that is a little bit of information about the, the show. So I'll stop there um, and have us get started, I guess. Um, really quick though, a little bit of um, housekeeping. So tonight you'll notice that it is in webinar format, um, but you're still welcome and we encourage you to join in in the conversation with our speaker and even myself using the um, Q&A button at the bottom of your window. Um, and you can offer any comments um, or questions during the talk and we'll definitely be saving some time for a Q&A at the end. Um, it's always a little bit more exciting um, when it's a, a lively and engaging experience for everyone. So absolutely, if you have any like personal connections, um, comments, you can add those to the chat. And then any questions for our speaker, um, you can add those to the Q&A anytime during the talk and we'll um, get to those 
um, at the end of um, at the end of the talk. So um, and uh, a little labor acknowledgement, uh, Will Alshweed and Chris Weir are here as co-hosts. So if you have any issues with the webinar tonight, you can message them directly and they can help you out. So thank you very much both for helping out. Um, all right, so tonight we are thrilled to welcome back Dr. Yuela Jacobs to the UAMA, um, even if it is virtually. One theme of the exhibition, The Art of Food, is eye candy. And that's really because you cannot talk about the representation of food without acknowledging how it has and continues to be used to connote beauty, sex, uh, and control. And uh, back in 2019, some of you might remember that for our exhibition, Botanical Relations, which is co-curated by uh, Uella Jacobs, she offered an incredible talk called Vegetal Eroticism. And it was an incredible talk. It was incredible. Um, it was really well received. Um, so we knew this year when we, we had to invite her back to the museum uh, to speak in relation to our current exhibition, The Art of Food. Um, Dr. Jacobs talked tonight, sexy salad and manly meat, are we really what we eat, uh, as a perfect addition to our series and our exhibition. Uh, so I'm very honored to introduce our speaker. Uh, Yoela Jacobs is Assistant Professor of German Studies, and she is affiliated faculty at the Arizona Institutes for Resilience, Solutions for the Environment and Society, the Department of Gender and Women's Studies, the Arizona Center for Juda Judaic Studies, and the Graduate Interdisciplinary Program on Social, Cultural, and Critical Theory. Dr. Jacobs' research focuses on the intersection of the 19th through 21st century German literature and film with plant studies, animal studies, environmental humanities, Jewish studies, the history of sexuality, and the history of science. Welcome back, uh, Yuela Jacobs. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, uh, Chelsea. Um, I wonder if this is working. Can everybody see uh, my slides behind me? And is my sound okay? Yep. All right, great. I'm so glad that this is working. Thanks. And thanks also for the um, affirmation in the chat. Uh, definitely feel free uh, to use the chat. Um, you know, uh, webinar formats are great because we can bring everyone together from around the world. And at the same time, it would be so nice to see more faces and, and see your reactions. So if you have any, feel free to um, put them in there. So I don't feel so alone up here. Well, up here, I don't even know, in this virtual space floating around on my slide. I'm glad that I could uh, draw your attention with this little poem of a title. <laughs> it rhymes, it has meter, and um, it is a question that um, I don't know if you've asked yourself before, um, but uh, let's see what we can get out of that question today. So um, I wanna start off with a uh, hypothetical scenario, and you can put your, your answers to that in the chat. So imagine this, you're working at a restaurant, somebody has ordered a salad, and somebody has ordered a steak. You don't know who has ordered what, but when you come up to the table, there is a man and a woman sitting there. What, which dish do you give to which person? Let me hear it in the chat. Where does the salad go? Where does the steak go? Let's say steak and, steak and baked potato just so you can picture the whole plate. All right, all right. Salad goes to the lady, steak goes to the man. Okay, that's the stereotype. Yes, and studies show that this is what people, what a lot of people would think. So you're not alone with this. Uh, and maybe you haven't thought before about the fact that food is gendered, but this example shows very clearly food is gendered just like so many other areas of life. And uh, one person who has um, written about that um, famously is Carol Adams. Um, she has written a book called The Sexual Politics of Meat and um, is, is pretty uh, famous for uh, what she's showing there. And she's showing something that's really prevalent in our society, um, namely that uh, we, um, well, I'll show you an example before I give it away. This is what she shows us, namely that 
sex and gender uh, and meat eating are connected. And here is, you know, a Thanksgiving survey. And I, I mean, we're almost there. So what do you prefer on Thanksgiving? And this, this campus talk survey says 60% uh, of people prefer breast meat, 26% uh, leg meat. There's a distinction between white meat, dark meat, 3% tofu. This ad looks a little little uh, older, so maybe the numbers are higher now for that, for tofurkey, I don't know. Um, but the image, of course, is the clue here. And this is what Carol Adams uh, talks about in her book, how much advertising um, and marketing uh, equates women with meat. And now I'm curious, what do you prefer for Thanksgiving? Give me something in the chat. What is it that you like to eat? Just so I get to know you a little bit. I'll give you a second to type. Stuffing, ham, there we go. Lots of alternatives. Wow, look at that. The turkey leg. All right. Okay, okay. And yeah, some of you might not be celebrating Thanksgiving. Of course, uh, you know, Germany, where I'm from, we also don't that celebrate Thanksgiving in that way, but I've, I've come to, you know, uh, like the food for sure and the traditions that come with it. Thank you for sharing. All right. So you see already in this image um, uh, uh, the point that Carol Adam is making, but um, I'll give you a couple of other examples of you thinking this is the exception of equating uh, women and animals as goods for consumptions and thereby objectifying them, sexualizing them, and fetishizing them. Here are a few more. The best butts in Georgia. We got the best rags and buns and thighs. And Carol Adams has a whole slideshow of examples spanning several decades. So, um, you know, it's, it's everywhere. And once we start seeing it, at least for me, I cannot unsee it. I start to see it in lots of different places. Now, um, one other concept she coins is the so-called absent referent, which uh, means we, we do not think of the cow when we see the steak, right? We even have um, often different words for, uh, for the meat cuts and the animal. Um, in, in the English language at least, so that we really remove this, this thought of what it is there on our plate, right? We're, we're very removed um, uh, nowadays, at least most of us, from the kind of, um, uh, from the meat production and, and from farming. And so um, we often don't even remember that there is an animal on our plate. Now, when I looked at the current exhibit, The Art of Food at the museum, I realized that there was an absent referent example in the exhibit. So that's my little detour that I wanna show you. Little detour um, of uh, the absent referent. Let me start you off. This is the first one. It's, it's the first in a series. And the series goes on like this. From the first bull to the second, to the third, to the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. And that's the end of my detour. You see the cow disappearing in this series. So if you are in uh, Tucson, um, go to the exhibit. I can only recommend it and, and take a look at that absent referent, the disappearing bull in the exhibit. So detour over, there are lots of cows, by the way, in the exhibit, as you, as you can see, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, all the examples I'm showing here at least are, are from the exhibit. So um, if meat is sexy, is meat also manly? Most of you said the steak should go to the man and I need to move my head out of the way so you can see this um, screenshot. Uh, study shows meat makes men sexy and someone quipping, I think we need a second opinion. So is meat manly? Um, Carol Adams would say that th that association stands in society. And I mean, your responses showed that as well, but what does that mean? One of the consequences of that is that there are a lot of ads that also say that not eating meat is gay. So the one on the right, um, it, it says in German, tofu is schules Fleisch, tofu is gay meat. And the one on the left, also not maybe as easy to read as the others, says a big fat juicy cheeseburger in a land of tofu. 
right? So there are ideas about manliness and what's supposedly manly uh, that are heteronormative written into this kind of advertising and are thinking about food and are thinking about vegetarianism, veganism, meat eating, um, sex and gender. Uh, and so, of course, that, those are those are harmful stereotypes wrapped up in in these conversations, and we already see. So, Carol Adams' argument is not only about women and meat eating; it is just as much about men, and it's just as much a damaging stereotype about masculinity, right? So that someone might tell you that you're not "quote unquote" a real man if you don't eat meat. Let me say, what bullshit? But sorry, apologies. We're in a live stream. Can I even say that? But you know, we had the bull on there, so literal. Mm -hmm. um, but these are damaging stereotypes, right? And they're wrapped up in our advertising and in, in, um, in uh, you know, in, at least in American culture, I see the same in German culture as you, as you see here, here in the exam, in the example. Um, and um, thank you for sharing in the chat too. It is, it is a really, really damaging stereotype. Um, and it goes both ways, right? It's damaging for ideas about masculinity. It's damaging about for ideas about sexual orientation, right? Um, all right. So there's there are more dimensions to this. What about race? Does race have anything to do with this? So this is the album cover of a, a, a rap album by the, the artist Ludacris, and he is playing with these stereotypes. Not only is there this leg that he eats, uh, he's sitting in front of fried chicken, he's salting the leg, there's hot sauce, and he's calling up a lot of stereotypes about race. Um, both about you know the stereotype about um, uh, uh, black folks uh, liking fried chicken more than other people, and also um, there is something here about uh, salt and heart disease actually too, if you look closely. And uh, Ludacris is playing with this in, in this in this uh, uh, image. You see you know you see that neon sign of the chicken up up also in the corner. Um, uh, but, you know, very, very consciously playing with this, but race is playing into a lot of these advertisements as well. Um, and we could go back to some of our images and we could, we could look at that. Remember the first one, the campus survey about uh, the white and the dark meat. Um, so uh, there too, um, we see these conversations and um, even religion, you might add in, this one is both about race and religion. So that slogan, pork, the other white meat, right? You've seen it around probably. Um, but if we're talking about pork, of course, we immediately also enter conversations about religion. If we think about uh, Judaism or Islam, um, and uh, we, we see that it, this topic it folds up all of societies, like all of society's big um, uh, contentious, uh, topics related to identity are are folded up in eating because, well, as it goes, right, we are what we eat, and uh, so that 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 connection of identity with with eating um, is is just everywhere. Uh, and of course, it is certainly political. This is my favorite headline of I think it was still this year. What is time? I don't know anymore. Uh, the headline is ex-Trump advisor mocked for claiming Biden pushing plant-based beer. Uh, and below it, it says Larry Kudlow grumbles that Biden's climate policies would force Americans to drink plant-based beer instead of meat-based. <laughs> so, you know, we start to forget what, uh, you know, you know, beer just as much as a loaded symbol um, connected to masculinity, connected also, of course, to national stereotypes as a German, I should know, right? Um, but we forget what, um, what is actually in, in these products and that, and, and that beer, at least German beer um, will always be vegetarian. So um, yeah, bummer, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, Ah, look, we 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 got a we got more uh, good good ch chat con uh, uh, contributions where we see that you know out in the wild in in Tucson. All right, so um, we we see all of that happening now. Um, what about plants? What about the salad? Is the salad gender too? Do we see any any of that with plants, or is it? entirely uh, a meat focused thing is is plant eating then you know aside from you know being coded as vegan and vegetarian sort of uh, uh, you know is it is it otherwise involved and um, I'm excited to tell you um, 
that I think so. And at first I wanna introduce another concept to you, it's called speciesism. So just like sexism or racism, another ism, maybe one that you're not as familiar with, um, it, it works like any other ism, it treats the members of a different species differently in this case, just like sexism would treat the members of, uh, a, different, of, a, of a certain sex uh, differently. Um, and so one example that is, that is very common for speciesism is uh, that we keep dogs as pets, but we eat pigs, and, but they have similar levels of intelligence. So uh, we have different standards there. And what you can already see in this is that speciesism is culturally inflected, right? Because this is not true for every culture. Not every culture um, uh, eats pigs or keeps dogs as pets. Um, not every culture considers the one clean or unclean or the, the other way around. So if you think about um, different kinds of animals, I'm, I'm sure you can come up with other examples where we, um, where we are all actively engaged in speciesism. It's something that is baked into the way we engage with the world around us. Now, very often speciesism is used to talk about animals, but what about plants? Plants are also living beings, members of another species. So the question arises, should we have ethical qualms about eating plants too, like we do about animals? What do you think? I'm, I'm curious, before I sort of go into this, to hear what you think about that. And those of you on the live stream, I might be commenting in comments on Facebook that I don't see, of course. Um, but I know that your questions will also be brought in for the Q&A. Yeah, there's somebody talking about fish, right? We sort of think that fish don't feel pain. Uh, that's definitely an example of speciesism and also proven not to be true. All right, so lack of a nervous system is one point being made of, uh, about plants. Plants are very different from animals, right? So, um, and interesting, uh, it also depends on the plant, right? Um, what about weed and tobacco? So what about the plants that are psychoactive that are changing um, the way humans function? Although there it's not about the plant so much as about the human reaction, right? The, the human, human response. And um, Alexandra says, yes, but if you're as a vegetarian, I will have to become a, how, how do I even say it? Breatharian, breatharian. Yeah, what do we eat? What's left if we don't eat plants? Right, that is that is a big question here. Thank you. So if we if we're looking at that range of answers, this is a question that is not perhaps there, there aren't any clear uh, culturally conceived notions perhaps that sort of guide us in the direction um, to think about plants this way as it, as there are for anim for animal eating and meat eating. Right. All right. So. Let me give you a uh, two sides of the, the issue. So should we, have, should we have qualms? There's one side that might say yes. And that is the question that, that those are uh, the people who are studying plant intelligence. And actually a lot of them call themselves plant neurobiologists. Somebody said there's no nervous system. So why neurobiologists? That does not seem to make sense. You, you know, you're studying something that's not there. But um, you know, researchers in that area are looking at plant behaviors and um, they're studying uh, plants for their own sake. Because one of the things that historically has been the case is that we've been studying plants for human usage, usage right? So we wanted to find out what can this plant get me? What can this plant provide for us? How we get, can we use it this way? How we, can we maximize the yield and so forth, right? That's how most plant research has happened. Uh, you know, medications, building materials, food, um, uh, uh, feed, all of these different uh, areas. I mean, plants really provide a lot for human consumption. If you look around yourself, wherever you are right now, I am sure you can plant, you can spot something plant-based. 
if it is the wood of the furniture around you, if it is the paper on your desk, there is plant-based stuff around you. Plants are really everywhere. And so a lot of our study has been about um, uh, how can plants serve us? But there is recent research that looks at what can plants do? And since they're not like animals like us, right? We're, we're animals too, right? We, we have animal bodies, we function in similar ways. But since plants don't, you know, have a brain, have a face, ha, uh, you know, and seem not to move, although that's not quite true. Um, they just don't, you know, uproot themselves uh, necessarily and walk away. Um, but they move all day. So since plants are so different, the question is really do you know, we, we barely know them, we barely know them. And it is, you know, plants are the, the, the biggest, um, uh, have the biggest percentage of biomass on this planet, and we need them to breathe. So it, it's time to get to know them. And this kind of recent research has looked at what plants do, and has purposefully called the abilities of plants, the capacities, the behaviors of plants, by, you know, names that we would also use for humans to draw awareness to that. And there's debate about that in the, in the um, plant sciences community. But words such as plant intelligence, plant memory are, are words that are used there. And so just to give you one example, plant memory, um, there was a study uh, conducted with mimosa, mimosa pudica plants. Those are the plants that uh, close up their leaves when you touch them, right? Uh, and so um, the study that was conducted there was if you drop these mimosa pudica plants regularly, usually they would close up their leaves, right? But after a while, they stop doing that because they remember that no harm comes to them from that act of dropping is what, you know, that study argues. So they argue for memory. Now you could call this something else, right? You could call it some sort of, you could find a technical term for it that doesn't sound like human behavior, but part of these new uh, research areas um, and, and what these scholars want to achieve is draw attention to plant behaviors, plant intelligence. If you're hearing this and you're thinking, she sounds nuts, also she's a German studies professor, why should I believe anything she says about plant studies? Um, I would recommend uh, the book, The Intelligent Plant by, um, oh, no, I can't remember his first name, but Mancuso is the last name, Mancuso, and uh, um, to, to look into that yourself. So that why it might be um, the pro side, right? People might say, well, if plants are intelligent, maybe I should eat them, right, based, based on that. I'm not sure the researchers themselves would say that, but that might be an argument you could, you could make. Um, for the pro side. Um, let me counter, let me counter. The counter side would, would perhaps point to plant reproduction. And this is where I think my argument would go. Plant reproduction functions in lots of different ways, right? A lot of plants get pollinated, which you see in this picture. There are also plants, uh, plants can also reproduce asexually, so they can, um, uh, rep and that's basically reproducing by clones. So if you rip up a plant, you can replant parts, depending on how sturdy that plant, that particular plant is and which parts you rip off. Um, and that type of reproduction by cloning uh, is, is called asexual reproduction. And pollination is the sexual reproduction. And if we think about um, pollination, why might this be my counter argument, argument for eating plants? Does anyone have a, an inkling where I might be going with this? Pollination, dropping seed. Yes, <laughs> Alexandra, you, you uh, I see that in the chat. She's saying we are dispersers. Yes, if humans, eat plants, that is actually evolutionarily how plants have developed to disperse their seed, right? A lot of plants do that. I mean, there are plants, you know, there are so many different kinds of reproduction that this doesn't, you know, this doesn't apply to every kind of plant equally in that way. But if we, and especially if animals eat plants and drop their seed, right, elsewhere, that is exactly how it's intended because the plant themselves, the, the plant itself doesn't uproot itself and, and move, but the animal will do it for it. And that's the same thing we do, of course, if we walk by a plant and accidentally brush it and then the next one, and we might have helped with pollination that way as well. So the problem, one might say, <laughs> is that we do not drop 
that seat in the woods anymore. We humans tend to go to the bathroom in our houses and we have filtration systems. So that I would say is really the problem here. Um, but generally what, this is of course a bit of a, uh, of a, of a uh, humorous point, but what I would say generally is that um, plants have evolved in together with humans, especially so-called what's called in German Kulturpflanzen, cultivated plants, um, have uh, developed to uh, work well with human structures. Of course, we change things fast and a lot of the time. So not everything we do is good for plants, but a lot of what's been around has been good, especially for specific plants. So um, for instance, Michael Pollan makes this, his name is really Pollan with an A, <laughs> makes this argument in his book, The Botany of Desire, saying that plants like potato, for instance, uh, apples have um, tulips um, and have uh, developed uh, to work particularly well with that, that they sort of have lured us humans into sustaining them, right? Because they have become so tasty to us. They figured out what we like that we keep planting them. Yeah. It's a really great book. I can, I can only recommend reading it. It's such a fun read. And so if we follow Michael Pollan's argument here that, um, that plants, over time have adapted to our tastes and they figured out how to attract us with colorful flowers, with uh, nice scents, with tasty fruit, um, that we're actually sustaining a lot of them. Of course, we're doing that now in monocultures and that, that is problematic. So I don't wanna paint this picture too rosy, but I do wanna say that plants are set up differently. We don't necessarily kill them when we eat them, right? A lot of fruit production, um, does not, uh, you know, does not kill, let's say, the tree. Um, and if we think about this from a species perspective, the species goes on, even if it's not the same individual plant every time. So there we have a pro, a, a counter argument, right? I, a lot to think about on both sides. All I want is, is sort of for you to think about the, the question broadly and not to tell you what to do, of course. Uh, also, I don't wanna tell anyone not to eat anything anymore. That would be really dangerous. So, so do, do eat dinner tonight, um, please. Um, but to think about these ethical questions, I think is, is, um, is worthwhile and fascinating. And it's really important, of course, as we're facing a climate emergency. So, I did lead you here saying that plants also have something to do with sex and gender. And uh, so that's what I'm getting to now. You should know plants are sexy too, not just meat as we saw on that one slide, but plants are as well. And it all started when uh, Linnaeus, who was called the father of taxonomy um, in 18th century, uh, 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 botanist created the taxonomy of plants that is based on their reproduction of their reproductive system. So the taxonomy of plants that we had from the 18th century on, which is now things are slightly different, you know, people have discovered other things in the meantime, but the basic one that really um, took the world by storm was based on their kind of reproduction. So uh, what kind of reproductive uh, setup the plant has. And uh, what Linnaeus found was that there are 24 different kinds of reproduction, but because he compared it to marriage, it was a bit of a problem. It was a bit of a scandal that he was saying, well, okay, so here plants are like men and women and they meet in a bridal chamber, uh, but oops, there's 24 different ways of doing this. And sometimes there are multiple men in this bridal chamber and sometimes multiple women and some of them change sex and some of them can actually reproduce with themselves and others do not do it like that at all and reproduce asexually. Nobody in the chamber. So that is, uh, was a scandal in the 18th century, as you can imagine. And it was a, uh, an, what I call it an anxiety about vegetal eroticism. And this is where some of my research comes in. I, it's what I call literary and cultural plant studies. There's a network for those of you who are maybe interested on a scholarly level. I picked out some, some, uh, nice plants for you here, you know, they're, they're uh, of course, you can go down rabbit holes on the internet about um, plants that look like uh, sexual organs. But remember, 
flowers are the genitals of plants, of, of those that are um, produce, reproducing by pollination. And this anxiety about vegetal eroticism, it started in the 18th century. It made botany really problematic for, for women who were pursuing it at the, at the time, right? It used to be that even, even the queen uh, and her daughters were drawing flowers and studying botany. And um, because everybody thought this is such a feminine, you know, innocent pursuit. Well, not when I sit in front of this slide, right? Uh, so once Linnea's system came out, uh, all of a sudden botany became um, a space to discuss human sexuality as well. Uh, and there were a lot of um, literary renditions that made fun of this. Uh, one famous one that I have here at the bottom where my head is, is Erasmus Darwin's The Love of Plants, a long poem. And, uh, but I'm gonna quote from a different one, Richard Polwheel, who is a, a, a Cornish clergyman. And he calls his poem, The Unsexed Females. And one passage uh, says, with bliss botanic as their bosoms heave, still pluck forbidden fruit with mother Eve, for puberty in signing florets pant, or point the prostitution of a plant, dissect its organ of unhallowed lust and fondly gaze the titillating dust. So he talks about women, women botanists whose bosoms heave with botanic bliss as they pluck forbidden fruit, which of course, Eve, you know, it all started with a plant and women are always to blame, right? Um, they look for puberty, uh, or the prostitution of a plant, uh, and they fondly gaze pollen, the titillating dust. So you see he's, he's uh, um, it's a satirical poem, but he was also really upset about this uh, and didn't want women to study botany anymore. So this is sort of the, the 18th century. These fears were picked up again around the turn uh, of the century around 1900 in Germany. That is part of what my research is about and um, satirized at a time where um, it wasn't just about women and their sexuality, but around 1900, it then was also about um, other sexual orientations and, uh, and, and, and something that um, Kate Sandy Lenz would call Queer Ecologies, another really good book I can pitch here and recommend. Kate Sandy Lenz, Queer Ecologies. All right, I'm getting close to the end of my talk, so you can ask me questions, um, but I do wanna get back to the exhibit. And this, of course, now you're not surprised probably that I'm bringing up Georgia O'Keeffe. Uh, the Red Canna is at, at, at the museum and it, it was part of the plant exhibit uh, in 2019. Um, of course, you've heard that flowers are like sexual organs before, right? Here it is. Uh, that's what everybody accuses uh, Georgia O'Keeffe of, or, you know, um, and uh, I think she is not in the Art of Food exhibit, but there are others. So now that you know how the sausage is made, as my announcement of the, for the talk said, you might see that exhibit differently. And for those of you who are far away, I just wanna give you a few examples of where you'll see this in the exhibit. Just gonna let these examples speak for themselves. Those are in the exhibit. And there are a few others. And with that, I hope I spoiled your viewing pleasure thoroughly <laughs> by making you think about all sorts of connections here about eating, sex, gender, um, 18th century panics about plants, and um, some of the harm that's done in today's advertising. Thank you very much. Uh, that was fantastic, uh, Dr. Jacobs. Thank you so much. Uh, so just a reminder, uh, folks can um, add more comments to the chat. It was fantastic that we had a really lively conversation there. Uh, loved it. Um, and any questions, you can leave them in the chat or the, or the Q&A. Um, uh, both our work great. Um, I know there was um, a question earlier about your thoughts on mushrooms. Someone mentioned that they'd learned that they were closer to humans 
than other plants. To animals, closer to animals. animals. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So people have, yeah, we have since learned that mushrooms are not plants. So um, uh, they're, they're, they now um, have their own uh, kingdom, queendom, I don't know. Uh, and um, uh, if you're interested in mushrooms, uh, The Mushroom at the End of the World uh, is the book to, to go to. Um, there is a lot of good writing about mushrooms and especially with mushrooms, especially about, um, uh, uh, ways of reproduction as well, because mushrooms in some ways, um, are a lot of people call them queer because they can do things that humans can only dream of, I guess. And so if you're interested in that, I, I can strongly recommend looking into mushrooms. There's some really good writing out these days. Um, and, and I'm happy to uh, give recommendations. If, if you didn't catch a book title or something, find me on the university website and I'm, I'm happy to, to send it to you. Thank you. I know, um, as you mentioned, that we won't be able to look at the exhibition the same way again uh, was definitely true for me. And I went back to after while you're talking to um, the Liechtenstein piece, the, the bowl that you kind of clicked through and showed us how it went from like the full, um, you know, kind of more realistic in depiction of a bowl into this fairly abstract, just line shapes, colors, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and on the outset, it, you know, might just be the artist playing with abstraction, but I couldn't help but think now that maybe there's, maybe there's a possible interpretation of us chewing up that bowl, like what happens as we, as we consume and kind of become that much more re removed mm -hmm. um, from what the object originally was. Um, I, yeah. I, I love that, you know, because the thing is when we eat, it becomes us, we become it, right? I mean, those, it's no longer clear. And, and this is something we think of ourselves as an individual that has closed boundaries, right? But that's not true. You're just now taking a breath and you, you're taking in lots of things that you can't see. And I mean, in the age of COVID, we, we're thinking more about, about that for sure, but as we're eating too, right? And um, in, in those processes, uh, animals and plants become us, we become part of them. And it, it is, I think, a really good question to, um, to, or it helps me relate differently to my environment when I think about that fact, because there is this, you know, nature culture divide that is upheld artificially a lot in culture where we see ourselves as outside of nature because we're the culture, the civilized, the, you know, at the top of the food chain and so forth. And we are, but even at the top of the food chain, we still ingest the whole food chain. We still become the whole food chain in a sense, right? And then to spin this thought further, the food chain becomes plant because, you know, once we're buried, that is what, you know, that is what we turn into. We turn into nutrients for, for uh, plants and animals around us. And so uh, we're part of that chain. We just don't like to think about it, I think, because it, it's, it relates to lots of topics, death, um, defecation, uh, uh, all sorts of things that we don't want to think about that we, that we think are a little, a little yucky, um, right. just as sex sometimes. Right. So, yeah. 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 And, and I mean, that also has me thinking about, um, uh, you know, when you're talking about like meat as it's, it's gendered and it, how it's represented in this very kind of manly way and then it's connotations in language and in visual representation. And when we think of plants, you know, the connotations are usually more of like, you know, scenes of nature, of nurturing, of um, like abundance, but yeah. in some ways in reality, especially when you factor in modern day um, industrial farming, um, there's oftentimes not been abundance, right? That has, that kind of colonial practice has led to, to famine, uh, right? And um, mm -hmm. yeah, so those, those practicings aren't as nurturing uh, as of the natural land, as, as you mentioned, like we're, we forget that we're, we're connected to. Um, yeah, yeah and so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on those distinctions. Yeah, yeah. I think out. it is really interesting to look at what we call natural. Look around just for a week, pay attention to where the word natural pops up on your food, on ideas about sexuality, on, like everything. It's everywhere. And, and, and that one, I mean, it, a lot of the time it does not mean anything remotely related to nature. Um, it, that's a really, a, a really um, interesting one. And I think, um, uh, the, the other thing, you know, is these images of nature are often 
associated with that kind of passivity, right? Plants don't move, they're passive. And very often um, that is uh, gendered feminine. And especially in languages that have grammatical gender like German, it's nature is feminine, flowers are feminine, uh, plants are feminine, all that. And, and I'm sure that in the languages that you all speak, you, you could you know, look to those words and, and I would bet that a lot of them are gendered feminine if, if it's a gendered language. So, um, and if we look at that, I think that that colonialist image that you, that you call up, right? A, a lot of people, you know, when they try to draw attention to um, to the climate emergency that we're in and to the way we treat the planet, right? They use also very violent and sometimes um, sexual uh, language, like raping the land and things like that, right? And and the same happens in, in these kinds of colonial discourses. I think there's a lot aligned with that. There's of course a lot of uh, discourses about land that go in different directions too, um, with uh, indigenous knowledges and um, relations to the land that are exactly not that violent, that um, that sort of uh, uh, establish a relationship that where it's not one is active, the other is passive, or where one is in domination and the other um, is, is sort of subjugated, but where the realization, and, and I mean, it's a very poignant realization that we're actually a often at the mercy of the land, right? I mean, we're just, of course we aren't when we're sitting in our car and we're sort of have our water bottle next to us and we're just driving from A to B. That's when we're not, we're, we're sort of mostly not at the mercy of the land. But I mean, we're here out in the desert. We, we know what it means to, to, to be, you know, uh, lost out hiking without water that that is incredibly dangerous and and you know so i think just thinking about these weird power dynamics that we that we establish where we tend to just sort of blend out one side of it often in, in the kinds of conversations and, and and ways of thinking and that we have about um nature and and all of those, those connected concepts i think is is uh is actually really insightful right to 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 stop for a moment and think, what if my car broke down now? What would that mean? What if, you know, what if I didn't have cell phone service? Am I prepared for anything? And um, most of the time, I would say for myself, probably woefully underprepared and also don't know enough about ways to survive with the land, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're so removed. And that's where the absent referent comes back in, back, comes back in. Mm -hmm. um, in, in a way, um, this extends to, to, the land, it's not just about animals. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, all right, well, there are some questions. I know I could keep asking you questions uh, and keep having a conversation about it. You got me thinking about so much, um, but there were a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, so Jill asked um, if you're willing to share in what ways, if any, have these topics, topics affected your personal diet? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, they make they make me struggle <laughs> with with what I eat, and I'll I'll put it that way because I don't want to present any kind of um, I think it's uh, you know there's often this kind of virtue signaling through through what we eat right because it is it becomes an an ethical question, and I I would say that it makes me struggle with what I eat it makes me think about what I eat um, it makes me think about where it comes from, and it makes me try to find solutions that take a lot of intersecting factors into account because it isn't just plants and animals that are a factor here. There's also human labor and exploitation that is a factor. Um, uh, there is a factor of supporting corporations versus, you know, uh, small businesses, all of these things. So there are social justice aspects to, to eating too. Um, and sometimes these things are at odds. Um, the, the demands, let's say, of animals, of, of the planet and of the people. Um, and I find that really, really tricky. And I try to find, I, I try to think through um, items that I eat frequently, because I think with all of this, when we try to change everything about our lives, it can be so overwhelming that we stop, right? And so I try to, with, with some of this, I try to be gradual and try to think about something that is in my diet every day and how I can, you know, make a better choice about that and, and what kind of choices there are and what that might look like. Um, you know, because you, let's say you cut out uh, uh, um, meat, you know, a dairy, but then you turn to almond milk and then you think about the water production that it takes to produce all this almond milk and how that harms the planet and, um, right? And, and then you think about the, the labor involved and it, you know, it, these, these are multi-layered um, uh, thought processes and conversations. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Starting gradual, I think, is good advice for sure. Um, wonderful. Well, uh, so I, Alexandra has uh, two great questions. Um, so first, uh, she says, this is a difficult question, uh, but what about the multi-layered gendered connotation of the agricultural industry, such as artificial fertilization and impregnation of female cattle, pigs, etc.? Many people relate to it in the control and abuse of female adult bodies. Mm -hmm. um, the, the language associated with it, uh, definitely. Um, where does that nuance issue fit into your research, if at all? Yeah, I mean, nuance is the word, right? I, I think it is incredibly complicated. I think uh, that's, that's, you know, that's for sure. Um, I'm just pulling up the Q&A so I can look at your question. Uh, um, so I think, um, let me maybe, let, let's go to the uh, artificial fertilization and impregnation. I think there's also, one of the things, for instance, that we never think about is, well, what is milk? It is, you know, it's it's the breast milk of cows. It is for the calves. It isn't for us, right? I mean, there's a lot of weird stigma around uh, breast human breast milk, right? But, but, you know, if we just called it breast milk in the supermarket, I think that right you know might uh, already have some the absent referent right the absent referent exactly there it is yeah. again and i think um so part of the question to me is uh so it's, it's a two-part thing it's it's about the sustainability in the long term right and who do we sustain farmers humans animals right everyone involved and then it's about the individual um uh uh kind of what kind of a life does an animal get to lead um, in this kind of system, right? And is there a way to bring these two together that it is a sustainable thing that still sustains farmers and, and humans who, uh, uh, you know, eat whatever um, the product is and, you know, offers a life for the animal that is appropriate to and here the words get tricky, right? To to what the animal, let's say needs, right? And by that, I don't only mean physical needs. I don't just mean food and water. I mean, very much sort of space, um, not being separated from offspring or children, right? Let's see which words we use and what kind of effect that has. Mm -hmm. um, uh, having space to roam around, living to a an age that isn't, just childhood because a lot of a lot of animals um right uh don't um outlive their their um childhood and i think that also goes to um uh, impregnation and the practices around that is there a way to do this naturally i mean there used to be ways right all of a lot of these um practices that have that word artificial in front of it like the one you mentioned are newer ones that are geared at making things more effective more efficient uh to produce at a mass scale and of course, it has to do with, with consumerism and demand, right? So it, I think the only way this can be shifted is by de through demand. And we're seeing some of that. We're seeing that with companies that produce um, uh, meat substitutes that are very, very close to actual meat, right? Uh, we've seen that on the US market that those um, have become affordable options to an extent and available options. And um, I think because human beings are, well, we, we like convenience. I, I was going to say we're lazy. I, I am lazy. You all like convenience. <laughs> and, um, and so, of course, it's easier if something is, A, affordable. I mean, that is incredibly important for that conversation, right? Because there's a stigmatization of, um, of, of poverty as well when it comes to eating. But um, so affordable, available uh, alternatives. And I think that can only get, happen through consumer demand. So if consumers demand happy chickens, right, with their dollars, um, more options uh, become available. And part of this demand is not happening because people don't, because of the absent reference, right? We don't wanna know that male chicks are shredded. We don't wanna know that female chickens, that their beaks are cut off um, so that they don't pick at each other because they're you know, in, in such dense conditions um, that, they, that they injure each other, all that stuff. So I think looking at the hard stuff is the first step and then making one's money speak, whether it's little money or, or a lot, right? Um, I think both of that matters. Um, but of course, this is a super complex issue. So, I mean, I'm not even, I'm not even touching, I'm not even beginning to, 
uh, we, did, we didn't advertise that we were going to solve it all in, in 60 minutes, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but bringing up really great questions and great um, con continuing questions to continue to ponder, right? Yeah. Um, so you kind of touched upon the second part of her question um, a little bit. We're talking about um, uh, Ooh, offspring, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. um, she asked, what about the emerging role of plant parenthood? What mm -hmm. do you think about that? Is it gender two, i.e. plant mom versus plant dad? Yeah. Now I have to, I have to all let you know a secret. Alexandra is um, a former student of mine who's gone on to do amazing things. And she's kind of plugging in an article I've written that's called Planned Parenthood. So <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and, um, you know, and I, but I think what, what your question is getting at is that those new trends, right? For instance, that we see on Instagram, um, plant, plant parents, and that have intensified throughout the pandemic, right? People have turned to animals. Um, as companions, but they've also turned to plants. And um, it's become this, this whole new trend to uh, post pictures with your, your plant um, children, your plant um, family. And uh, I think it is a really interesting development. I think it is a, it is a great one because um, it, it gets people to think about nature. If I were nitpicky, I would say, all right, all of these plants are in pots, they're inside. Does that make them happy? I don't know. I can't answer that question, right? But I think there are some possible questions one might ask about why we, um, what, what this means. And I think it is also, of course, a, a sign that a generation is sending, a generation that is um, not getting, and I'm not, now we're getting into other issues, but it's a, it's a generation that is not able to easily afford the house with the white picket fence and the dog and the two kids. And so that leaves plants, right? And I think there is an, the, there are uh, signals sent there um, that are both positive and that, that say something about um, this climate emergency, the future this generation is facing. And I mean, all of us are facing, but especially newer generations and, and the way um, people conceptualize that future, because often this goes along with uh, uh, conscious choices not to have children um, and, um, or at least around the rhetoric of, I can't afford it. At least in the U.S., right, where um, where where that is particularly difficult because of of the policies surrounding uh, uh, families, uh, parental leave, uh, support, mm -hmm. and and the money it takes to raise yeah. a child, educate a child. Yeah, you can't talk about uh, food without talking about power, access, yeah. control. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting into all the world issues here, but but it is all connected. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's two great, uh, two more great questions. So I hope um, we can stick around to answer those. Um, so Juan asked, uh, do you think that the way food media portrays gender and food advertising comes from historical trends or has it been the other way around and food media has caused gender roles to be spread? Basically, I'm asking the chicken and egg question. Mm -hmm. uh, no pun intended, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Which one came first? Well, okay. Of course, it's a chicken and egg question. Nobody can really answer that. Um, at the same time, uh, I think, uh, you know, I think, you know, the ways we think about gender, the way cult different cultures think about gender is something that in, in some ways, of course, predates at least this rampant advertising and this rampant thinking about food that way, right? Because if you think about different cultural contexts, maybe in, a, in another cultural context, the steak wouldn't go to the man and the salad to the, the woman at that table, right? Maybe in a different cultural context, the father wouldn't get the biggest piece of meat at the table or all these weird traditions that we have around eating, right? We could imagine that maybe, let's say there is an expectant, expectant mother or she gets the best piece or something like that, right? We could imagine different scenarios. Um, so I do think the way we, uh, um, I think advertising has exacerbated it. And as just as it has exacerbated um, trends about beauty uh, and, and, and all sorts of other ideas about bodies and identity and, and how you know, the perfect person should look, behave and be. I mean, we're seeing it on Instagram coincidentally, right? Along with the plants, we also see those harmful body trends and all of that as well. Um, so I think 
this advertising is just showing us with 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 clarity what's going on. There's, for instance, one one trend that um, I think exemplifies as well. It's called hot dog legs. It's a, it's a, it's it's older now. It's not a trend anymore. But you would take a picture of um, your your size, and they look like like uh, buns. Uh, uh, and so uh, that, you know, that was gone for a while. So hot dog legs, um, and it has to do with beauty standards too, right? And it has, it is something that's not even produced by um, advertising companies, but by individuals. And I think that's where it sort of comes in. Once we start reproducing it ourselves, where does that kind of uh, network of, you know, intersecting web of connections end, yeah. right? Yeah. The feedback loop, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, as, as someone who studies visual culture, I, I find that question is a great question to, mm -hmm. to keep uh, problematizing, I guess. Um, all right, so last question is actually in the, um, the chat. Um, uh, Jamie Gunderson, who I might, uh, I'll, I'll plug also was a, um, one of our speakers um, a few yeah. months ago over the summer, uh, mm -hmm. gave a great talk on the representation of the Bible um, and used some great images from our collection. Um, she asked, uh, does thinking about food, whether plants or animals, as actants in the sense of Bruno Latour's non-human agency or Jane Bennett's vibrant manner, offer a possibility for reorienting, reorienting our gendered relationship with food? I think it does. I think it does. So, so those are, um, you know, references to, to, um, to, I think, especially the Jane Bennett one. I mean, both of them are really prevalent um, uh, theories in thinking about uh, nature and, and, and other species. And I, um, you know, uh, I think even just thinking about plants um, can get you away from gendered uh, thinking because there are so many options there. And I mean, I, I think Alexandra also added uh, below, right, that there's a lot of uh, queer connections with the plant parenthood as well. I do think plants give us ways to think differently about identity because with animal bodies, there's just too much similarity in some ways, right? Um, but when we get to plants, when we get to microbes, when we get to fungi, when we get to all these different kinds of entities, um, all of a sudden we're relating on a different level, right? We're no longer thinking about these, um, these markers. And uh, to me, that is something that also makes me think differently about, about myself when I think about um, such organisms and the way we are connected to them. And I think that's, that's what uh, responds to this you know, question of food and um, the kind of uh, connection here, and and of course, what's inherent in these in these theories as well is that they have agency. That that these others all have agency. That we're not the only ones um, acting on the world and determining how things go. And I mean, what if COVID hasn't showed us that? I mean, viruses. Okay, is in between living and, 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 and not living. So it's a bit of a tricky category if we talk about organisms and so forth, but still it, it's shown us that we're not in the driver's seat, that we're not in control of everything, right? And um, maybe not in a positive way as maybe plants could or, or as, as animals might, um, but certainly that kind of agency, if we, if we pay attention to it, we see, we see it everywhere around us. And I do think it can change how we, how we eat, how we relate to sex and gender and, and all of these questions. Uh, fantastic. I, I think that um, just ended up being a perfect um, kind of place to end. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jacobs, for an incredible talk. Um, I can tell just by how many questions we got and the, the um, enthusiasm in the chat that it was um, everyone uh, just a round of applause. Thank you so much. And I know that um, we'll probably be having you back if you'll come back. Um, always always an engaging conversation and there's always such great connections to um to our collection or exhibitions and visual culture as as always it was fantastic um and thank you all for for joining um just one last mention no, november 9th um one of the artists actually that um was mentioned in the presentation malia jensen uh worth your salt um malia will be here on november 9th in person um, that'll be really exciting to actually have one of our first in-person talks of the season, um, November 9th. You can find more information on our website as well. Uh, so thank you everyone for uh, joining us here tonight. And thank you again, um, Dr. Yola Jacobs. It was just a pleasure to, to have you back with us. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for coming. It was nice to see some familiar names as well. Have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>